Hi, this is Pastor Manny Gonzalez at Gold River Calvary Chapel. Thank you for joining me for this edition of our Bible study, for our midweek study here. Let's go ahead and open with prayer. Father, thank you again uh, for our time, Lord, that we can gather here, Lord, even though it's online, Lord, that we're sharing in your word, we're learning from your word, Lord, and that we can grow from your word. Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit again um, bring to remembrance, teach us what it is that you would want us to know, Lord, that we may grow in the knowledge and grace of who you are. We just thank you, Lord, for our time together. We pray that you bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, have you ever noticed that when a loved one leaves for, say, for a long time, whether it be for, you know, like a family member or a close friend, what holds you together is the love that you have for each other. And you notice that when you do uh, come back, it could be years later and you, re and, and, and you have like this little mini reunion, you know, what ties you together is um, not only that you know each other, it's that you also love each other. Well, a similar thing happened or was going to happen with Jesus and his disciples. Jesus was getting ready to leave this world. But what will carry his disciples forward is their love for him and his love for them. But there is one thing that Jesus said he would do for his disciples, as well as for us, followers of Christ, since then, is that he gave us a gift, the person of the Holy Spirit, to take his place. And the beauty of this is that having the Holy Spirit in our lives is like having Jesus himself. Yes, two distinct persons and personalities, but same essence in deity and attributes. In this study, Jesus has given assurances to his disciples of a, <clears throat> a love that produces obedience, um, that they won't be left as orphans. Um, again, the gift of the helper who is the Holy Spirit and his peace. And there are more things that he will assure them with, you know, as we get all the way through um, John chapter 17. But today we're going to go ahead and complete chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, Turn your Bibles to John chapter 14, John chapter 14. And our title of this message is Jesus's assurances for his followers. So let's go to um, John chapter 14, verse 15 and 18. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he will give you another help helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it never because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. <clears throat> now, that word if, and there's a lot of ifs in um, chapter 14, can be used as a conditional word. Commentator uh, Richard, um, Bible commentator Richard D. Phillips uh, writes, if ifs of John chapter 14 do not make our salvation, uh, do not make our salvation less certain, but more certain, as long as the conditions are met, Christians must comprehend Christ, and then we will understand God. Christians must pray, and then Christ will answer. These cause and effect relationships in God's economy of which we may be absolutely certain and from which we may derive great comfort. So here is Jesus. He gives his disciples a condition based on the relationship with him. If you love me, keep my commandments. This condition really is based on their obedience to him. Therefore, if they say they love the Lord, they will express their love through their obedience towards Jesus and fulfilling his words and obeying his words. Our love cannot be empty words. There is nothing like saying um, you love someone, but it's nothing but empty words and you show nothing for it. So our love cannot be empty words, but must, sh must show some kind of expression of that said love for him. Our obedience to Jesus and his word is how we show our love to him. Jesus now introduces the Holy Spirit of God. One of the things that Jesus had prayed for his disciple and for all future followers of Jesus, that the Father will give them and us a helper. And this helper is the Holy Spirit, and He dwells within every believer in Christ Jesus, and that's forever. He does not dwell temporarily, but He dwells permanently, forever. So, 
what does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? Well, notice that he says another helper. God, the Father is going to send a, another helper. Our first helper is Jesus. But another helper or the other helper is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The word another as used here means a different person, but having the same qualities, essence, and attributes of some known person or persons like, in this case, Jesus. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is of the same kind, not of a different kind. This is really um, getting really into the area of the triune God, which we call the Holy Trinity or the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy um, Ghost or the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons and personalities. The Holy Spirit is co-eternal, who co-exists with the Father and the Son, Jesus. The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. And the Spirit is not the Son. And yet the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is one God. Having said this, this does not mean that there are three gods, but it is one God existing in three persons. This is what we call the Holy Trinity. You know. So, one source explains when studying this subject that the word Trinity is not found in Scripture. This is a term that is used to, to attempt to describe the triune God. Three coexistence, co-eternal persons who are of God, of real importance in, is that the concept represented by the word Trinity does exist in Scripture. The concept represented by the word Trinity does exist in Scripture. John chapter 14, verse 6 is an excellent text for the support of the triune God, of where all three members of the Trinity are mentioned here. Jesus, the Son, prayed to the Father who would give the Holy Spirit. So now we have established that the Holy Spirit is God and is distinct and co-eternal who coexist with God the Father and God the Son. And in, in fact, I just thought of this now. It's not in my notes, but I think one of the things that we can kind of um, think of is say like water, like H2O. We can get water or H2O in steam, right, in liquid form, gas liquid form and solid but all three make it is water and it's the same thing the father son and the holy spirit is god three person three distinct personalities co-eternal co-existing with one another continue on the holy spirit is another helper the word helper in the greek it's a familiar word with many christian is the word parakletos the noun refers to one who helps advocates or comforts someone on behalf of another. The concept combines the legal and relational, that is the advocate and helper. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is a relational person in his ministry in helping followers of Christ. He abides alongside Christians. Actually, the word abide means to stay with or to lodge. So the Spirit res resides within us believers in Christ. He is in us. But there is more to understanding the word helper. And the root of this word are the ideas of advising, exhorting, comforting, strengthening, interceding, and encouraging. It also means one who has been called alongside of another, like a lawyer or an advocate who can uh, mediate on our behalf. Another word for helper is comforter, as found in the King James Version of the Bible. Of a translation of the Bible. I like, I like what the late um, Bible teacher Harry Ironside said about you know, using the word and, and just the word comforter. He shares, quote, there is a sweetness and preciousness about that word comforter that appeals to the heart. Our English word comforter comes from two Latin words, con and fortis, the one meaning to be in a, comp a company with and the other to strengthen fortis think of like the word fort strength so that actually the comforter is one who strengthens by companionship I, that's a great phrase that is one of the great ministries of the holy spirit the paraclete is one who comes to your side to help to give aid and so the word is properly used meaning the word comforter 
An attorney at law or an advocate is one who comes to help you in your legal difficulties, and the Holy Spirit is all this. He has come from heaven as promised by our blessed Lord to assist us in every crisis and every time of difficulty that may arise in our Christian life lives. He strengthens by his companionship, close quote. That is, uh, that is a really, really great phrase of the Holy Spirit as the helper, the comforter. He strengthens by his companionship. Remember those words. Those, that's, that's really good. So all these things are what the Holy Spirit is to us and for us. But Jesus says more about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is truth. Therefore, there is no lie. There is no deceit. There's nothing like that in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the but, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, compares, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Another thing about the Spirit of the or the Holy Spirit is that he cannot be received by the world, for the world does not know the Holy Spirit, but only for the saved in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Also notice the pronoun he. The Holy Spirit is not some inanimate object. Like, you know, for example, like we uh, call like a ship, she, you know, like you say, there she blows or, you know, there she goes out in, in the water and, and, and such. Or when we look at a beautiful car, you know, or a beautiful guitar, we, we never say, oh, he's a beauty or, you know, we, we never say that. We always say she's a beauty. That, that, that guitar, you know, or that uh, car, you know, she's a beauty. The pronoun he used here for the Holy Spirit is to point that he is a living person, a supreme being, and he's not impersonal. The Holy Spirit is to dwell within every individual in Christ Jesus. Jesus said that the Spirit will be in you. Now, in the Old Testament, certain individuals were filled with God's Spirit to do special or um, specific work of God, but that He, that is the Holy Spirit, will be in you is in reference to the Holy Spirit indwelling in every believer in Christ Jesus permanently, which took place during the day of Pentecost. So Jesus said that, I wouldn't, He also said that, I will never leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Now, this can mean, this can mean that at the day of Pentecost, the person of the Holy Spirit will dwell within you, making you no longer an orphan in this world, but a child of God adopted into his family. However, it can also refer to Jesus coming back to his disciple after um, his resurrection and when he left the, um, the grave, or speaking of his second coming for his church. But the assurance, and this, this is really important, the, the assurance we have as followers of Jesus is that we have the Holy Spirit in us and all that He is, the moment, you know, and all that He is, that the moment we accept it on Jesus Christ in our, in our lives. Let me re, uh, re, uh, read that again. The assurance we have as followers of Jesus is that we have the Holy Spirit in us and all that He is, the moment we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So the moment you took Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, immediately at that moment when you ask for your forgiveness, confession of sin, and you ask Jesus in your heart, the, that moment, immediately, the Holy Spirit has now dwelt in your heart, in your life. We have been assured that the Holy Spirit will help us in our faith as we walk with Christ. Verse 19 through 21. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Jesus is saying that they will see him, you know, maybe in reference to after the resurrection, defeating, you know, sin and death, 
Jesus' disciples and all his followers of Christ will live in this newness of life in him. Now, through the ministry, though, of the Holy Spirit, he will make uh, for an impactful experience in the lives of believers. Many Bible uh, scholars believe that at that day is really in reference to the arrival of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. It is the Spirit of truth who will show that Jesus and the Father are one and that we as his children, as his followers, are one in Christ as well. One of the things we need to realize is that the closer we walk with Jesus, the more he will show and manifest himself to us. And the key word is uh, the key word is the word keeps in verse 21. The word keep in the Greek speaks of o- obedience. It is an action word. This verb can indicate obedience as keeping commandments or words. But if you wander off from Jesus, you will not be able to receive what he's wanting you to know about him. It's about having a relationship with Jesus. It's about abiding with him. That one gets to know about Jesus. One Bible teacher shared a very good practical analogy. I think it was Tony Evans who said this. If you listen to a radio station in your car, you know that the the further you get from the broadcast station, the worse your reception of the signal gets. Many people have difficulty connecting with God because they've wandered too far away to pick up his signal. But if you come back home in obedience, relating to God, through Christ in love, he will disclose more of himself to you. I think that's a really um, great analogy. So we are to actively be obedient to God's word as an expression of our love for him, but not only as an expression of our love for him, so that we can know him, so we can build this relationship that we have. Remember, Jesus does not want to hide anything from, from, uh, from his followers. He wants to manifest himself to you, to me, because we all have a relationship with him. So how effective can a marriage be if one or the other are open or not open about each other or to each other? The marriage relationship blossoms blossoms when both husband and wife are transparent and are willing to know and love each other more and more each day. Amen? Growth and understanding comes when we are together, not when we're apart from each other. It's the same with our relationship with our uh, Savior, Jesus Christ. So, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me, and because they love me, my Father will, will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Verse 22 through 24, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. So in response to verse really 19, a different Judas, not Iscariot, basically asked Jesus, you know, how can you do both? You can't do both. How, how can you be seen by the disciples and at the same time not be seen in the world? So Judas, who is not Iscariot, was thinking of Jesus' physical presence, not thinking of, you know, of Jesus returning back to heaven, which would make sense, you know, out of this confusion. But Jesus was speaking of the inner work that he was going to manifest himself as his followers remained here in the world and as he returns back to heaven. Jesus will manifest himself through his followers when they express their love and their act of, of obedience to him. In other words, obedience is the consequence of their love for Jesus. Remember that word to keep, it, it speaks of to obey speaks of obedience. You obey the words of Jesus because you love him. It's the it's, it's same thing with um, growing up with parents, loving parents. 
you know, um, many times, if not all the time, you know, you express your love uh, for your parents when you obey them. Okay, it's no difference here. But not only are you obeying Jesus, you are also obeying the Father for, as Jesus said, what I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. In other words, as one um, Bible commentator shared, a sobering way of stating Jesus' point is to say, the quality of our obedience is a direct reflection of our love for Jesus. And how true is that? But he also said in turn that if one does not carry out his words, it means that you don't have, you're either lacking love for him or you have no love for him. In other words, your obedience is Jesus, to Jesus' words is a reflection of having no love for him. And to have no love for him through your disobedience also means that um, uh, means you have rejected the words of the Father for the words of Jesus were sent from the Father. See, remember the two are one. So in reality, to disobey Jesus is to disobey the Father. So just as your obedience is an expression of your love for Jesus, you are expressing it also to the Father as well. Verse 25 to 26, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father <clears throat> will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So with what little time they had, you know, Jesus was moved to share, you know, many things. <clears throat> Though Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit again by name here, does that mean that he, he's picking up the, 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 um, the subject of the Holy Spirit? All that he has said so far, I really believe it's all connected with the Holy Spirit. How Jesus was going to manifest himself in those who loves him and how he and God the Father will dwell within the lives of believers is all attributed through the work of the Holy Spirit, who takes up residence within the lives of all believers. All that he has said so far since verse 15, I really believe is all tied to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, all that Jesus shared that night before his arrest, suffering, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection will all one day come back to remembrance through the act through the active ministry of the Holy Spirit, of whom the Father will send in Jesus' place after he ascends back to heaven. Jesus assured them that this will all make sense very soon. <clears throat> because we have the promises of God and that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we have the assurance that he keeps his promises and that we have the assurance that the Holy Spirit is forever active and interceding on our behalf. The Holy Spirit will not only continue the presence of Jesus within the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit will not only continue the presence of Jesus within you as a child of God, but will also teach you and bring to remembrance in Jesus' name, that when he says in Jesus' name, that is the, in the authority of that name, the continued work where Jesus left off. So in other words, the Holy Spirit did not come um, with something new or something different or with its own agenda, but continues to carry on the work of Jesus. Just as the Son did the work of the Father, the Spirit will do the work and, and the continued work of the Son. Again, here we see the triune God. Here we see the Trinity at work. <clears throat> this is all very important to grasp and, and to know, for the Holy Spirit is not a force, as unfortunately even some Christians like to compare from the world or the ideology of Star Wars. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force, but a personal being, a supreme being at that. There's more that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, but that's one of the things we got to remember is that he is not impersonal. He's just not like this idea or, or this entity that's just kind of floating around or, or whatever. 
He is a person always involved in the life of God's children. What we need to grasp here, grasp here is that Jesus gave, Jesus gave his disciples, as well as us today, the assurance that we will not be left alone like orphans, but that we, will, we have the Holy Spirit who comes alongside of us to guide us and to teach us the things of God. And as the Holy Spirit teaches us the knowledge and grace of Christ through the Word, we respond in kind. We respond in obedience to the guidance and instruction of the Spirit because we love Jesus. Verse 27 to 28. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So far, Jesus has been giving his disciples much needed yet assuring information, assuring information, for their time together was close at hand. Jesus has more to say, but you know, he, he's, he's really sensitive to his friends here. You know, earlier he addressed them as little children, and now he gave them more words of assurance that he will leave with them a, a peace, not a relative peace that um, many people did experience during what's called the Pax Romana, which was peace in Rome, you know, which was in the time of Jesus. But Jesus said the peace that he would give is his peace that the world cannot give. In fact, it's, the, it's, it's a peace that the world cannot understand. It is often said that certain dictatorial government or communist countries have peace, but it is driven by fear at the cost of their freedom. There is another form of peace we, can, we may experience here in the United States. As one commentator pointed out, quote, the world can give a sort of peace, temporary freedom from distraction that allows us to live with little interference. The world provides the peace of escapism found in our times of daydreams or amusements. And we've all done it. You know, we can go through life going through some hard mess, man. And then we can, you know, what do we do? Some of us go to the bottle and, you know, we drink our way trying to find that peace. Some of us go shopping thinking for that moment, yeah, you feel good. But that's not until the next sale comes up and you're out shopping again. You know, we, we do different things or we go on a vacation and stuff. Yeah, the vacation is, is great. It's relaxing and stuff. But only what? To come back to deal with the very thing that is robbing you of your peace, if you would. But if truth be told, there is something in every person that wants a sense of true and real peace in their lives that can overcome um, the fear and anxiety this world produces. And it, it, let, let's not fool ourselves. This world has a knack of producing fear and anxiety. Those are peace killers. You know, people are talking about war and stuff. Just that alone it's a, a fear and anxiety. Those, those, those things alone rob us of our peace. So this world produces every day that fear and anxiety. And that peace can only be, the true peace can only be found and can only be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. But the peace that Jesus offers is not like the world's. The word peace in Hebrew is shalom, and it really means hello or goodbye. Uh, think of it um, um, like uh, Hawaii. You know, Debbie and I, when we were there, you know, they, you know, they say aloha. You know, and it would means you know both, you know, hi and, and goodbye. But the shalom or the peace that Jesus offers is a peace. Hear this: is a peace that can withstand any of life's circumstances, troubles hardships, trials. In fact, we are not guaranteed that we will not experience such things. But what we are guaranteed as we walk with Christ 
is his peace. And that is that peace that will carry us through all those things. And it is his peace that can settle one's troubled heart. And for the Christian, the best way to experience and enjoy God's peace is when we yield ourselves to the will of God. Peace comes when we stop trying to do it our way, where we think we have the answer to everything, right? Or trying to live it our way. And, it, and, and what we need to do is to trust in God. It's when we, when we are experiencing fear, trouble, chaos and all, what we want to do is take that and then focus it, turn it around and then focus it to Jesus. It's like focus our heart, our mind to Jesus. Because when we can focus our mind and our hearts to Jesus, then we know how to live um, through that. Okay. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Very, very familiar passage of scripture. Trust in the Lord, Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Other translation says that he will direct your paths straight. He also assured them that not to let their hearts be troubled or be afraid. The world is indeed a cruel place with all its negative influences that can rattle us to our very core. But the way to sell, settle our hearts, our troubled hearts, is through his peace. The Apostle Paul wrote these familiar words found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Um, a little shout out to the ladies. They're starting up next week. I think it's the 8th on Thursday. Uh, and they're going to go into the, um, the book of Philippians. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything my, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. True peace is not found in positive thinking, in absence of conflict, or in good feelings. It comes from knowing that God is in control. And that's a really good way of uh, looking at um, Jesus' peace. True peace comes from knowing that God is in control. So ask yourself this question. Whatever you're going through right now, is God in control? Is he? Because true peace comes from knowing that God is in control. Notice that the word guard in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And it is a military term, which means, in this case, to surround and protect the thoughts of our minds and emotions to our hearts from worldly or other outside influence. <clears throat> and one way we can develop in guarding our hearts and minds with the peace of God is, again, by daily being in the Word of God. For when you are in God's Word every day through prayer and meditation, you will experience his peace in your life. As commentator Merrill um, C. Tenney stated, that the peace he spoke of is the calmness of confidence in God. That's another good one. The calmness of confidence in God. And that is the peace of Christ. What I really like about Jesus' words to his disciple is that until, at that, at that point in time, until the arrival of the other comforter, the other helper, the Holy Spirit, I just love how Jesus continues to be a helper and a comforter to his disciples. You know, him being the, their paraclete. He brings assurances in their trust in him. Now, when Jesus said that the Father was greater than him. Jesus was speaking from the position of, like, we would think like more like of rank. Not that he is less of a God or that he was a lesser God than the Father. Jesus was about to fulfill his role as being the sacrificial lamb of God, to die for the sins of the world as a man. But never did Jesus, not once in his life, cease to be God. He was fulfilling his role as one sent from the Father who would later restore him. The Father would later restore him in Jesus, that is, in the fullness of all his glory. For when Jesus was praying for himself in John chapter 17, 
verse 1 through 5. Jesus said this in verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And which really takes us back to the very beginning, right? John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, proclaiming the deity of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 29 through 31, And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, and you may believe, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Again, his time with his friends, his uh, men that he has been with for at least three, if not three plus years, is, 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 is decreasing by the hour. For the enemy, Satan, is going to make his move on Jesus shortly uh, through Judas Iscariot, through his betrayal, and the, and the force of the religious elites that will follow. There is an urgency in Jesus. He shared as much as what was to come so that when everything he said comes to pass, it will serve to help and strengthen their faith in him. This is really important for every member will have a role once the birth of the church um, took place in the day of Pentecost. And what came to pass along with all his teachings, with the help of the Holy Spirit, his disciples later shared which, you know, the, the teachings and the word of God, which became the foundation of faith and growth of something brand new called Christianity, the church, the bride of Christ. And then notice the word Satan in relation to Jesus. He has nothing in me. I love that. But a better translation is he has no power over me or he has no claim over me. Now, Satan has a hold or a claim, if you so to speak, over humanity because of sin. But he has never ever held uh, um had a hold over Jesus for he was sinless. Jesus was sinless. And as the sinless or spotless lamb of God sent obeying the you know the father's will, he will have victory over Satan as well as sin and death the moment he was lifted up on the cross at Calvary as the exalted one and not as the defeated one. Jesus' obedience to the Father was Jesus' expression of his love for the Father, just as our obedience to Jesus is an expression of our love for him, as stated in verse 15, 21, and 23. <clears throat> at this point, Jesus was ready to leave, tell everybody, hey, let's get up and let's get ready to go. Um, at, you know, where they had gathered for their dinner, this Passover. Now, was Jesus speaking, you know, in, in, in chapters 15 through 17, while everyone was still kind of standing around, you know, we're about to leave and he's still talking, or maybe he was speaking on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Whatever that was, that's where we're going to leave off until next week. So in, in closing, what blessed assurance that we have in Christ that there are benefits when we love him as he loves as we obey his words, that we become more like him manifesting himself every day in our lives. And that we have the Holy Spirit, our helper, our comforter, who teaches us, who advocates for us, who helps us, who brings to remembrance the truth of God's word. That all these things that he helps us to become more like Christ. That we have a peace that surpasses all understanding that we can endure whatever life throws at us, that we are not left as orphans and that we are loved by God. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are just full of assurances for your children, Lord. And I thank you for the truth of your word, Lord. And you know, Lord, help us not to wander off 
from the truth of your word and from our relationship from you with you, Lord. Help us to always stay with you, connected with you through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, Lord, so that our lives and our minds can be transformed, Lord, can be conformed to the likeness of who you are. Father God, we just pray for all these things, Lord. And again and again, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you have given us that dwells within us, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us um, this week. Um, again, next Thursday, the women are starting up a brand new uh, study. I, it is um, the book of Philippians. I encourage you to come. Women, join us. They're going to meet in Thursday morning in person and then in the evening um, through Zoom online. And also, this week, we have um, Good Friday, and then we have Resurrection Sunday. So until then, blessings to y'all. Bye.